Excellent. Welcome everyone to another episode of Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A video. This is episode number 39, and uh, as you can see, I've been doing this for quite some time. Look at all of the old Probing Pauls, times I've been probed in the past. I remember them well with fondness, as always. But let's uh, get right into it with the first question for today. This question is from Dion Spates, and he says, Hey Paul, can you recommend some good 1440p 144Hz monitors? Uh, very good question. Actually, I've looked into this a few times. What I'd like to be able to say to you guys is I've gone out and got a bunch of these monitors and tested them all myself, but I can't. I haven't done that. I, I can't really say that. So what I'm going to do is tell you guys how I would shop for a monitor in this range, because I think it's a it's a great solution. You're looking for a high refresh rate monitor, which is one of the key aspects of PC gaming is that, you, that you want to take into account. 1440p is a great resolution, not quite 4K, but also a lot easier to push, and you don't necessarily need to spend $1,000 on a graphics card or anything like that. And you can usually find monitors that meet these requirements in the $300 to $500 range. I wouldn't spend too much more than $500 dollars on a monitor like this though because at that point you should maybe be looking at an ultra wide or a 4k or just something that has a little bit more features what i've done is used pc part picker to look at screen sizes between 24 and 32 inches because i think that's where you'll find the best bargains we're looking at a resolution of 2560 by 1440 and we're looking for a refresh rate that's 144 hertz or better i've also taken the liberty of only looking at FreeSync and g-sync compatible monitors because if you are trying to push 1440 at 144 hertz or better there's a chance depending on the game that you're playing that you might dip below that. If you do dip below that, you'll be in a much better situation with a FreeSync or G-Sync compatible monitor than you would otherwise. And since the Nvidia cards now work with FreeSync monitors, you actually have a lot more to choose from there as well. So if I'm looking at this list, we can find some very inexpensive ones down in at 250 bucks. These are 27 inch, 144 Hertz, 1440. Uh, we also wanna look at the response time. Lower is better. Typically you can find TN panels and VA panels in the one millisecond response time range. IPS panels, you're probably gonna have to pay a little bit more for, although that's, those have gotten a lot faster too, and you can sometimes find those in the one millisecond range. But VA or TN is probably the panel type you should keep an eye on if you're looking for a good bang for the buck. Now down here at the bottom, we have some Acer models. I thought it was kind of interesting because these are actually available at Walmart, apparently Walmart building crappy computers and also selling inexpensive displays. But it's out of stock and it's 20 bucks more than it said it was gonna be on PC Part Picker. So let's ignore those super budget ones and instead just focus on those parameters that I talked about when it comes to the refresh rate, resolution, response time, the panel type. And then of course you wanna go with a monitor brand that you've probably heard of before. Fortunately, there aren't too many cut rate monitor brands out there. I am now going to go over several monitors that were recommended by people in the response to that question in last month's video, because there were actually quite a few, some that I've heard of some that I haven't. These are listed on Amazon and I'll link them down in the description. Here's a Samsung C32 HD70, which is 32 inches, 144 Hertz. It's got a slight curve to it. I don't mind a curved monitor. I hate curved TVs, but a curved monitor is okay. $520 is a little bit more on the expensive side, but this one does also have FreeSync 2 support and that is nice. FreeSync 2 support is a little bit better than FreeSync 1 support. Next is a Dell, the S2417DG, also 1440. This one is a a little bit smaller, 24 inches, but also a lot less expensive at $329. This is an LED backlit TN panel, which supports G-Sync, so that's really nice. And we have 165 Hertz refresh rate, which is a little bit better than 144. Here's another Dell. This one is very similar to the other one. It's LED backlit G-Sync support uh, 1440p. This one's 150 bucks more though, because it's 27 inches instead of 24. So you get a bit more screen space with that one, but you have to pay more money. Here's a BenQ. EX3203R, also curved, also 32 inches, so this one's larger. WQHD and 144 hertz for $450. Got a couple models from ASUS. This is the MG279Q, which has a really nice stand, height, tilt, swivel, pivot, and all that good stuff. Uh, it's a nice ASUS monitor with a four millisecond response time. It is an IPS display, but it is FreeSync support, 144 hertz, 27 inch, $450 for that one. Here is a, a little bit more expensive ASUS ROG. So this is part of the ROG Swift series. This one is G-Sync support, 165 hertz, one millisecond for $520. So all those I think are pretty good solutions. Uh, and hopefully those parameters I've discussed give you a better idea of how to hunt down a monitor to your liking 
within that range. And again, I, I wish I could just get all these monitors to test, but it's really challenging to get a bunch of monitors and do side by side testing. I will give it a shout out to Hardware Unbox because Tim has been doing monitor testing over there. And I feel like he's really kind of taking it to the next level when it comes to methodology. So check out Tim's monitor reviews as well. That was a long time spent on the first question though. So I'm gonna try to go through the rest of these relatively quickly. Next question is from Air Force 46270. Hey Paul, love your channel. I was wondering what your thoughts on manually overclocking the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. Uh, Greg from Science Studio says you never should. Jay's apparently from Jay's Two Cents says you should. So what's the deal? Uh, I will say I have not done a ton of overclocking with Ryzen 3000 series as of yet. So most of my knowledge is derived from watching other people's videos. Manually overclocking is something that I feel like PC builders and enthusiasts is, is kind of something that they want to do uh, overall. I think with the Ryzen 3000 series uh, and the Ryzen 2000 series, if you're going for a maximum all core overclocked and trying to hit a specific frequency on a bunch of cores, running all cores and all threads at the same time, then you might be able to get a little bit better result with manual overclocking. That said, Ryzen 1st and 2nd gen and Ryzen 3000 series as well have some really nice features for automatic overclock. So if you just go into the Ryzen Master software and turn on PBO and Auto OC, you can get higher frequencies if you're willing to deal with some higher temperatures. And I've never really been able to achieve the highest single core and dual core frequencies that Ryzen can achieve by itself with manual overclocking. That's not to say it can't be done. It just would probably take more time and effort and tweaking than was necessary otherwise. So I tend to recommend people just take advantage of those features, PBR, Auto OC, XFR, because it will automatically overclock itself. It'll give itself a little bit more of an overclock if you upgrade your cooling solution as well. And uh, it's really only for the hardcore enthusiasts who are gonna spend like a long time tweaking and tuning settings who might be able to eke out a little bit more performance. But I think here I would actually lean towards Greg's recommendation because XFR and PBO, are, they're doing a great job. Next question from Killer Deadbot. Hey Paul, what do you think would be the best entry level graphics card for VR? Uh, this is a good question. I have a few recommendations, but basically you're gonna be spending $350 or more for an entry level VR graphics card. That's not to say you couldn't get away with something a little bit less. I'm just saying, if you're talking about VR now and VR in the future, uh, you probably wanna get invest in something a little bit higher end. So I would go for potentially a Radeon 5700 or 5700 XT, which you can get for $350 to $400. The RTX 2060 Super is also a pretty beastly card. It doesn't always line up price to performance wise with the RX 5700 series from uh, Radeon, but it does give you a little bit more performance in VR specifically. So consider going to 400 to $450 range for something like that. Uh, it seems like these are hard to find for 400 bucks. Don't get this standard 2060 because it's only got six gigs. You want the 2060 Super, which has eight gigs. Anything in the RTX line there or up, I would recommend. And then if you're looking to save some money, look towards the last generation, the 10 series of cards from uh, NVIDIA because the 1070 Ti or better, you could probably find a reasonable deal on a used card. And that would also give you eight gigs of VRAM as well as a pretty well performing card where you can maybe find a bit better of a deal. Next question from n one Mal who says, my question is why are there some 32 gig DDR4 kits or four by eight gigs that are more expensive than two 16 gig two by eight gig kits? Can at least to problems going with two two by eight gig kits to get yourself to 32 gigs rather than a single four by eight gig kit. The first thing I wanna do here is reality check. So I'm just looking at Newegg, sold by Newegg. I'm looking at DDR4 3600 memory and I'm looking at both the 16 gig two by eight gig variants and the 32 gig four by eight gig variants. And I think if you're finding more expensive 32 gig kits, it's probably just pricing that hasn't shifted yet. Depending on the retailer you're looking at, some are more active at updating pricing as prices fluctuate, which they do very frequently, especially if you're talking about system RAM. But I'm just scrolling down here and these are all 16 gig kits for 100 to $120, $130. And there's actually the first 32 gig kit right here in this G-Skill Sniper X series, which is $160, which is actually a really good deal. If if you're considering the single kit over here for $82, well then I guess actually that makes perfect sense this being 160. But this is a little bit less money than going with two of those 16 gig kits. And there's actually quite a few other 32 gig kits uh, coming up here in the maybe 150 to $180 range. So, so I think the 32 gig kits that you've been seeing are just residual pricing that's stuck around that hasn't dropped down to fall in line with what's actually currently available. Second part of your question though is dual channel kit versus quad channel or two dual channel kits versus a single quad channel kit. The difference there is going to be XMP settings. Quad channel kits have an XMP profile that's made assuming you're gonna have four sticks installed. Dual channel kits have an XMP settings that are assuming that you're gonna have two sticks installed. So it's possible that you might take your two 
two stick kits and try to set up XMP settings and actually it wouldn't work because the timings are too tight or you just don't have enough flexibility to work with all four sticks in there. You'll have a little bit more assurance if you're going with a quad channel kit that you can run at the rated speeds out of the box. And then beyond that, of course, just keep an eye on different retailers because if you're seeing a really expensive 32 gig kit, chances are there's another retailer that's brought it down to fall in line with current pricing uh, and you can maybe find a little bit better deal. So those, that's my recommendation for you. Next question is from Sebro. He says, hey Paul, love the video. So thank you. Uh, I was wondering since the new Ryzen 3000 series APUs are still running Zen Plus. Do you need to update the BIOS on 400 series chipsets or do they just work out of the box? He's thinking about using a 3400G with a B450 Tomahawk. I did a video recently on updating various motherboard BIOSes from the 300 series and 400 series of motherboards to see if they'd work with the new 3000 series CPUs. I was able to get all of them working, but none of them were working with the new processor with an old BIOS. So back to your question though, we have three generations of Ryzen currently out on the market. First gen, which is based on 14 nanometer Zen, second gen, which is based on 12 nanometer Zen Plus, and now we have third gen, the Ryzen 3000 series, which is based on Zen 2, and that's seven nanometer. However, when it comes to the APUs, it gets a little bit more confusing. The 2000 series APUs were actually based on that first gen Zen 14 nanometer architecture, and now we have some 3000 series APUs, but they're actually based on the 12 nanometer Zen Plus architecture. To answer your question though, no. Your motherboard is not looking at the architecture, it's looking at the identifier for the CPU itself. Your motherboard, with whatever current BIOS it's running, has a list of CPUs that will, it will accept that, yes, work, and we can proceed with doing the functions that a computer does. If your processor is not on that list in the BIOS, then it's just not gonna work. The microarchitecture doesn't really matter. What matters is the BIOS being updated to say, oh, a 3400G, I recognize that and know what it is. And if you're dealing with any BIOS that's prior to the 3000 series launch, or the BIOSes that were, that were released just leading up to the 3000 series launch, it's not gonna have that hardware ID in there, so it's not gonna recognize the chip and it won't work. But the B450 Tomahawk does have USB BIOS Flashback Plus, so you can update without a CPU in there, so you should be able to get it working with the 3000 series processor. Just knock on wood that you don't have any of the issues that some other people have reported to me. I haven't had any issues with them myself, so that's all I can say about that. Next question here from Xenotrex. Hey Paul, could you please make a Ryzen 3rd gen budget PC build since I think a lot of people are now looking to build a PC, especially during the summer. Uh, my recent Ryzen 3rd gen PCs have been around $1,000 and that's because I think the good entry level Ryzen 3000 CPU to use starts off with the Ryzen 5 3600. Six cores, 12 threads, that's $200. Parting out the rest of a system around a $200 PC in my brain, leads you to about a $900 to $1,000 overall price. You can cut down on that some by going with the lower end graphics card, but that also cuts down your graphics performance and you probably wanna line up a nice graphics card with a $200 CPU. So that's kind of the budget range I've been going with. However, I was just talking about the Ryzen 3000 series APUs, and that's actually probably what I would recommend if you're just getting started. And the Ryzen 3400G, I believe is what it's called, is actually better priced than the Ryzen 2400 G was. It's only about 150 bucks. It's a quad core, so you don't get quite as much CPU performance, but it's got Vega graphics integrated to it, uh, which is perfectly adequate for 1080 gaming. Um, and I should do a build with this soon too. So yes, yes, I will do what you asked. Jason3893 asks, Hey Paul, I love the videos. Thank you, Jason. Uh, what things do you need to watch out for if you plan on changing your system from Intel to AMD and want to only change the CPU and motherboard? So I imagine people who are rocking older Intel systems like you know Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge or something like that might be looking to upgrade right now. And AMD is kind of the, the hotness. So a lot of people looking to do that. The good news is when it comes to general hardware, uh, there's not really any difference. Uh, there's LGA versus PGA when it comes to the CPUs and the sockets themselves, uh, but changing your system, if you're involving changing the motherboard, if you have an operating system installed on your existing motherboard, like Windows 10, and it is licensed to that motherboard, you might need to repurchase your operating system uh, to install on the new system. And then the other thing I'd warn you is if you have existing DDR4 memory, which is very possible if you're dealing with an Intel system from the past uh, six to eight years, you probably wanna upgrade that to faster memory because chances are if you're dealing with older DDR4, it's maybe 2133 or 2400 speed and Ryzen just does much better with faster memory. You probably want 3200 speed at minimum, ideally 3600 speed, and you wanna make sure that the memory will be compatible with your AMD platform. So pick your motherboard out, check the QVL list for memory that's been tested to work with your motherboard, choose from that list and you'll be pretty assured that you can get memory that will just 
plug in with the XMP values and work at the higher rated speed right out of the box. Beyond that, it's it's the same. It's the same process building a computer for Intel or AMD right now. And they both, they're both functional. So there's not a whole lot of other details to worry about besides that. Just a couple more questions here. These are getting a little bit more random, but Abbott De Las Alas asks, do you have any favorite Filipino dishes? Uh, my wife is originally from the Philippines, so I have quite a few Filipino dishes that I have tried. Uh, like adobo, of course, is always good. My favorite is probably lumpia, which is like Filipino egg rolls, which are always delicious. But I wanna give a shout out right now, actually, to something called the Filipino breakfast, uh, which I've just looked up some pic pictures of here. Filipino breakfast is usually something like this. Uh, you've got some rice, you have a fried egg, and then you have have some meat, which is sometimes fried spam, or it can be also something like Vienna sausages, or it can be these little guys, which are called langonisa, which are also absolutely delicious. I can't say I like fish for breakfast, so I wouldn't do that, but you know, I love a mango in there, but uh, yeah, give me some like garlic fried rice and like some fried spam or some langonisa and uh, a nice fried egg. And like, oh my gosh, such a delicious hearty breakfast, which I, we have pretty frequently here. Last question here from Tristris389. Uh, I guess not a question. My dad asked me why I'm watching a video called Probing Paul. And that's probably a good point to end this video because I don't have a good explanation for it. Well, I mean, Probing Paul, the name for this segment comes from all the way back when Kyle and I used to do Yoked on, on, on Newegg TV back in the day. So um, some of the earlier episodes, I kind of talked a little bit more about where that came from, but I, I just, it seems like an appropriate title. People are asking me questions, probing for more details about my life and everything. And you know, if it sounds suggestive or dirty, I think that's because of you, not because of me. Thanks for watching this video though, guys. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to leave me some questions down in the comment section for next month. Uh, I've got more videos planned for this week, so stick around for those two. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed it. We'll see you guys next time.